back to the Hall of Fame. Uh, other names have been announced. They have? I guess that was you wanting me to pitch some names at you. I was, I was, who do you want to talk about next? I was, it was, it was called, a, I'm trying to have some verbal intercourse with you and you're not wanting to have intercourse with me. No means no. <laughs> but I'll throw another name at you. Someone who, in a lot of ways, I guess you could say you gave his big break to, although he had done a few things in Puerto Rico and in Memphis, but Glenn Jacobs, the mayor of Knox County, Kane, Dr. Isaac Yankum. Hey. Diesel 2. <laughs> I don't know what we call that character exactly, or just Diesel, I guess. <laughs> but what do you think about Kane going into the Hall of Fame? And, and obviously, now we're back to reality because this is one of the ticket sellers. They they always want main event guys and, and stars. Kane is what, at this point, he's the longest running roster member, right? Continuous WWE roster guy since 1990, was it six? No, actually, Isaac Yankin was five because he left before we closed Smoggy Mountain. So... Since 1995, and he's made seven figures a year on more than one occasion. Uh, he's, you know, one of the standout names of the Attitude Era when pay-per-views were doing huge business, when houses were doing big business, when the ratings were big. Um, more people would see Kane in the course of a week on one television program than, than see all the TV programs on a national basis, put together every week this week, you know, uh, this year or in these times. So, I mean, you know, Glenn, he's been a model employee. His politics are a little screwy, uh, but he's been a model employee. He never did anything outside the ring to embarrass himself or the company. Uh, his matches were well thought of. Obviously, the promo thing uh, was was... It, until he, you know, found the vocal cord transplant or however they explained when he's been mute for <laughs> fucking four years and suddenly he can talk again. I don't know. But the point is... He was a burn victim. Well, and then they got the, you know, the artificial <laughs> voice box and then the they put a skull face, you know, the, the they skinned a skull and put a new face on for him. Anyway, um, yeah, except for his politics, I can't and have never been able to say anything bad about Glenn. And even then, he's not a fucking irrational QAnon, we want to storm the Capitol lunatic. He's just closer to a Republican as a libertarian than he is to a Democrat. But there, that's a main event, Hall of Fame, especially a WWE Hall of Fame. Because when you think about it, Kane never, Kane never wrestled for any other wrestling promotion in the United States of America besides Memphis Wrestling, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and the WWE. Well, he did a right? job. He did a job in WCW. I saw, I think, a clip of him. No, I'm Sting. saying Kane. Oh, Kane as Kane. a gimmick. Okay, yes. And actually, well, then, it, it, yes, he did uh, jobs a couple times when he'd been in business, like two months on a couple of WCW tapings. Six ten, they have him as a job guy. Yeah, well, TV well, show. look at the look at the time period. And then he pretty much went to Puerto Rico, so you can make the case that still. Glenn Jacobs, besides two job appearances for, he was like Big Bubba, um, two job appearances for WCW, and then Memphis, Smoky Mountain, Puerto Rico, if you count that as the continental United States, and uh, WWE in a 26, seven year career. You know, when you and brought him in. consistent. When you brought him in with a name that hasn't aged very well, Unabomb. <laughs> Why? Why is it now? Is there a is there a lobby to prevent people from maligning Unabombers? Well, I think we want to uh, not do anything to, in any way, celebrate domestic terrorists. <laughs> but it kind of ended up all right for him because even though a lot of fans sit back and say, "Oh, I really wish I could have seen what Eddie Gilbert would have done in Smoky Mountain," him and Al Snow was the better combination. Yeah, it made more sense. I've said it before, whatever anyone wants to say about Al Snow, I thought he was one of the best heels in the entire business in 95 in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And then he never was that guy ever again. Yeah. Because he went, you know, he did head in ECW, became Avatar in WWE, became a new rocker. 
But as just a heel Al Snow, he was great in Smoky Mountain with Unabom. And I don't know if it would have been that great with Unabom and Eddie Gilbert as a unit. But what do you think? Well, Eddie was... Eddie was smarter to the business at that time. Eddie was more experienced on C. Al had been wrestling since 1982, and this was 1995, but he had never done television, except for when he was a rookie, he did the Pafos show as a job guy. Eddie obviously had been all over all kinds of television and had tons of experience and was smart to the business, but I, I don't know if they would have had the chemistry personally. And I think that Eddie would have probably taken more of the spotlight just because he was that oversized personality not like he's going to be shitting on glenn but al al was hungry and brand new and fresh and different and and i've joked that the you know the first couple of tvs since he'd never done it his promos were the shits he didn't he wasn't comfortable and he didn't even want to talk. Right. But then after two or three weeks and, and I talked to him a couple of times, I'm like, you know, eh. all of a sudden, then he started talking. He got it. It turned on quickly. He started talking and you couldn't shut him up. And then his interviews would always go over. I started having to add extra time on the formats for Al Snow to talk, but it was good. So he just, but he was, Al was really wanting to do something and he never had the chance to do it up until that point. Whereas, Eddie, you know, it was Knoxville at that point was kind of a, a step down after he'd been in WCW and, you know, the things that he wanted to do. And, you know, so I don't think he was that hungry and just that, that was going to put that much oomph in it. He would have been good, but I think Al and Glenn had better chemistry and they were just, they were hungry and ready to do something. If Eddie had stayed, do you think you eventually you would have had a problem? Cause he, I mean, at this point in his career, he only wanted the book. He didn't yeah. want to just be a talent on a show. He wanted to be a booker. Well, see, that's why I told him, because also, remember, I'd been doing it 92, 93, 94, three solid years. I said, Eddie, um, we can talk, you and I, about your stuff, and then you take it and run with it. And just make sure I know what you're doing. If you've got any other ideas, I'm more than welcome to hear them. If he had come in and done a Buddy Landell, the second run, where he was showing up on time, he was clean, he was wearing suits, and responsible i could have seen letting eddie book smoky mountain wrestling but in he showed up the once (laughs) and did the tv and then never came back and went to puerto rico and to book to book but you know it didn't work out well i i don't know at that time i don't know that the the money could have been much different that i mean obviously they were paying him more money in puerto rico than i was going to be paying him in in smoky mountain but he would have had to have worked three or four days a week in the other end of the state that he lived in rather than going to puerto rico and the living conditions that prevailed down there for the boys at that time and etc to make another three or four hundred dollars a week and it, it, you know, it would have been better if he'd have stayed, obviously, because he wouldn't have been close to the Puerto Rican pharmacies. Um, but it also, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe he wanted to get away from, you know, the continental United States. I have no idea. But all in all, I guess he just wanted to be the booker somewhere. Back to Kane. When Isaac Yankum happens, and he had a good match with Brett, but the gimmick was death. Yeah, yeah. And then the new Diesel, otherwise known as Diesel, (laughs) because they pretended it was really Diesel. (laughs) Did you think something like Kane would happen? Or did at any point you think this guy has size, he's smart, he can go in the ring for a guy that size? He's just not going to get a chance. At any point, you think he wouldn't get his chance because oh of the yeah, way he had well been used. yeah, I was led to believe he wasn't going to get a chance when Vince said, "Well, we're probably going to have to let that boy go." <laughs> That's, that was a good indication <laughs> um, that he went. No, Vince, I he never admitted it, but he went to the dentist one day and had an idea, and that's because he they had already. I already knew he was interested in Glenn because Taker had come down to Smoky Mountain and and worked with him. 
And, you know, I'd put in a word for him because, you you know, you could see that's where he needed to be. Glenn was tailor-made for guys like Taker and Big Show and Mark Henry, whole nine yards, the Giants, land of the Giants. Um, And he, I knew he could make a ton of money up there. But when Vince called me, and I've mentioned this, he called me so giddy. I, I can't wait to send you the videos we've done of Glenn. He's Isaac Yankum. Dr. I yank him. He's a dentist and he's got the jaws teeth, the, the rotten teeth. And oh my God. And I'm trying to, on the other end of the phone go, Oh, that's, that's, that's lovely. And you know, it, it, they even gave Vince liked it so much. That's why he put him with Lawler because he wanted Lawler to talk it over, get it over by talking. Right. And it just, it was just a rotten gimmick that wasn't going to end. And Glenn didn't feel comfortable and nobody, that was another joke profession. So then I thought, but, but they still had faith in him. It was never his work or performance or attitude or, you know, him that was the problem. So then I've mentioned this story before also, so I'll gloss over it real quickly, but I was still on the creative team with fake razor and diesel. And we had had a meeting at Vince's house to discuss the television that was coming up that was going to be shot the following Monday and Tuesday. And then I go on the road on Saturday, Friday and Saturday, or whatever it was, to manage Vader. And I walk in the building in Tulsa, and all the boys are asking me, hey, we hear Razor and Diesel are coming back? This is like Saturday, and I'd just been at a creative meeting on Thursday. I'm like, what are you fucking talking about? We heard it on Livewire, whatever the Saturday morning show was at that point, that they said, ah, they're coming back. They're going to be on Raw on Monday. I'm like, what? And that's when I called Bruce, who was still in Connecticut. I said, why is everybody saying that Razor and Diesel are coming back? Well, uh, Vince had an idea, and uh, we own the characters. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <sighs> so... <laughs> So that's the way sometimes the creative team members would find if you, if you weren't in town for a day or if you slept overnight, cause Vince never does, you'd find out that these new stars were debuting on the show. You thought you'd just written anyway. And that was fucking abysmal. And that's when, and at, at, at a meeting one time, Vince didn't believe that Glenn had what he called the killer instinct. He did not vicious enough. He just, and he was overlooking the fact that he Glenn was self-conscious and not comfortable going out there either doing a dumb gimmick or going out there and pretending to be somebody else and getting hooted at by the fans. And that's why he couldn't show his true self. And and he made the statement, well, you know, if, if he can't find the killer instinct, I'm afraid we're going to have to let him go. He's a great prospect. And then, and we've mentioned this before, I... Uh, I, I can't say that Bruce Pritchard was the one that had the idea for the undertaker's evil brother specifically. Um, he called him Cain because they'd been playing with that name for the undertaker. And Bruce was always closely involved in what taker did. Uh, so I can't say the concept of a brother, but then the concept of the brother Cain as it, as he came up, you know, was, was discussed by Bruce. And, and then I had the idea, as I've mentioned, it's, he sounds like Michael Myers to me. Why don't we do videos of, you know, because to introduce the vignettes that uh, they used to do to introduce people from Kane's point of view, he's behind and I'm still going back to the Glenn wore the hockey mask like humongous when he was Unabom. Uh, Michael Myers has got the William Shatner mask in Halloween. You could see the point of view shot in Halloween through, from Michael Myers's eyes through the mask. What if we just saw through this mask of some kind and with the muffled breathing and through the eye holes, you, you're in a room that is completely covered, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, with pictures of The Undertaker, a la the Omen movies where the, the priest is trying to protect himself. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm researching from entertainment, right? 
I saw him as a fucking, you know, somewhat of a mentally demented serial killer with potential supernatural powers that you didn't, he was human, but you didn't quite understand how he could do the things he did, a la Michael Myers. And of course, when we got the costumes from Creative Services, the drawings for the cane outfit, because he'd been burned up in a fire, he looked more like a fucking Fantastic Four costume for the Human Torch. So the 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 uh, low key aspect of him was thrown out the window. But then once we introduced him, <laughs> yeah. naturally if you've been burned to a crisp, yeah, you want your outfit to show leotards. flames. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're wearing the red leotards. But um, but then since I knew Glenn and worked with him a bunch and knew what he could do, and I'm the one who taught him how to work like Kevin Nash, that took 15 minutes. Um they gave me a lot of Kane's early matches and I, you know, I've said, I pitched the pulling the door off the hell in a cell based on Doug Furness and what Kevin Sullivan did with him in Knoxville and all those stories. But for a lot of the initial several months of, of Kane, I was his producer so that we could come up with ways to try to, I never wanted him to actually do supernatural things. If I was, it was never my idea. He or the Undertaker, either one, would throw lightning from their hands. The idea that, is that he's a human, but he's a giant human. He's a fucking mentally fucked up human behind that mask. And maybe he's got some kind of supernatural tolerance to pain or ability to withstand things. And maybe he can do some spooky things where you wonder, well, how'd he do that? But you don't just come out and. It, it, they went, as usual, everybody went haywire with the supernatural aspects uh, during and immediately afterwards the after the Attitude Era, and it got a little gaga. But I thought the the original, much like the original version of most classic comic book characters and their origin story is more simple and believable, and then it gets crazier as you go. I like the guy that what always scared me about horror movies was not the, the giant space creatures that you're like, okay, this ain't good. It was the fucking spooky, possibly real mentally fucked up halfway supernatural serial killer that you could believe and buy that shit's scary. I'm, I'm not too scared of the goddamn invisible man. 